we're telling you, international community, please get us the Palestinian state. There are hundreds of resolutions that could support the Palestinians in bidding for their statehood. This is the time where the international community should wake its conscience and look around them. This is the only occupation left in modern history. What a shame. Alternate Focus recently spoke with Ambassador Manuel Hassassian, the head of the Palestinian General Delegation to the United Kingdom. Born in Jerusalem, Hassassian received his Ph.D. in political science from the University of Cincinnati. He spent 25 years as a professor of political science and international relations at Bethlehem University and has served as a visiting scholar at universities across Europe and the United States. Hassassian has published over a hundred reviews, articles, and chapters on topics ranging from Palestinian political culture to civic society and Palestinian refugees. He has served as the president of UNESCO's Palestinian European American Cooperation in Education program, known as the Peace Program. He has also represented and served as a consultant for the PLO in numerous negotiations. We spoke with the ambassador about a range of issues, from the right of return for Palestinian refugees to Israeli settlements. We now present part two of this interview, in which we begin by asking the ambassador how reconciliation with Hamas would affect negotiations with Israel. The million bucks question. First of all, I feel very agonized and perturbed to talk about such an issue for the simple fact that factionism, unfortunately, I'm gonna say it as a historian, has always been a phenomenon in Palestinian national movement. And I don't go back to history, but let me just say a few words about this. Hamas, as an Islamic resistance movement, came into existence in 1988 or 87, during the First Intifada. And it became a power to reckon with. Arafat then had two options whether to co-opt Hamas or to fight Hamas. He, feel, he felt at that time co-opting Hamas is very important since we were struggling against occupation, and he needed to create that kind of consensus. Fine. But Hamas reached a point where it mobilized people, and it came to the fore as a power to reckon with because of the failure of Fatah. So 2006, when the elections took place, Hamas won landslide because of the protest vote of the Palestinians against the corruption of Fatah and against the corruption of the leadership. I say that even when I was an ambassador because we cannot deny the facts and we cannot uh, just uh, pretend not to call a spade a spade. I think Hamas needs the, the PLO and needs to be incorporated in the PLO because the PLO is our ultimate reference. And uh, I would like uh, just to explain to our viewers the fact that whether Hamas recognizes Israel or not is insignificant in this context because when we talk about formal negotiations, we don't talk about parties and factions negotiating with Israel. We're talking about an umbrella organization that is the PLO that will be discussing and negotiating future Palestinian state. And now, as you know, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, are accepting to become part of the PLO. So in, in, in coming May, we're going to have, hopefully, presidential election, legislative election, and the Palestinian National Council election for the PLO. So the question of recognition is by de facto. If Hamas and Islamic Jihad become part of the PLO, and the PLO has already recognized the state of Israel in 1988, so what is the problem? Then Hamas, by de facto, will recognize the state of Israel. But you see, what Israel is trying to do, they don't want this national consensus to come into existence. They want the Palestinians to be totally divided, you know, uh, using the old tactics of the British mandate, divide and rule, because that's the way they can nurture like 
vultures on conflict within the contradictions of Palestinian society. And unfortunately, we have given them this opportunity the last five years. And now I think there is a, a sense of realism by Hamas and Fatah that they cannot continue with this kind of conflict because the ultimate winner of this is going to be uh, basically Israel. And this is where I tie back the Arab Spring to our Arab Spring uh, is not uh, basically anti Fatah or anti Hamas, but a consensual approach to become anti occupation in a strategy of peaceful resistance, which eventually will put Israel on its toes and you will exonerate the state of Israel from all its democratic, alleged democratic values. And I see the reconciliation is coming. It's a fait accompli, it's a matter of time. And I see elections coming next year. And I see Israel is going to be in a very tough spot in not recognizing the, 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 the PLO again. And I see the position of the United States will be weaker if they support the state of Israel. And if President Obama wins, I think we have a slight window of opportunity that things might move in the right, in the right direction. I, I see the Europeans uh, almost you know, backing the Palestinian uh, issue. If you look at the support we get from Europe, it, in comparison to the United States, the gap is very wide. I see the non-aligned countries you know, supporting the Palestinians, African countries, Asian, Asiatic countries, and what have you. So I think Israel cannot continue, as I said earlier, to be a pariah state. And Israel has to understand, if it wants to be a legitimate nation state in the Middle East, the only ones who would give them that birth certificate are the Palestinians. Without the Palestinians, Well, actually, this is one of uh, the several sticky issues. And the right of return is a, retire, is, a, is, a, is a right that I consider to be holy for Palestinians. I don't think any single Palestinian leader, Abu Ammar or Abu Mazen, or any future leader will compromise on the right of return. This is a right for Palestinians to go back to their original homes. It's their right to decide whether they want to go, whether they would accept compensation, whether they would like to repatriate in a third, in a third country, in a host country, whether they would repatriate, resettle in the state of Palestine. This is utterly the choice of the Palestinian refugee. The Palestinian leadership cannot make any decisions on behalf of the refugees. And if we want to do that, we have to take their opinions, we have to factor their opinions, what they want, and accordingly, there are you know, many possible and plausible solutions to this conflict. Maybe the time is not here, but I have written extensively on all scenarios of, for refugees, how to settle this issue. As you know, the most important part of the Palestinian refugees that are living in dismal conditions are the 300 to 350,000 living in Lebanon. Now, if you talk about you know, Palestinians living in the diaspora, in the United States, Canada, and what have you, those are established you know, Palestinians who are integrated, assimilated in host countries. But they are denied to go back to their homes. They should have the right to go back, and they should decide whether they want to stay in the host country or go back. They are entitled to have Palestinian passports. They are entitled to go and invest in that part of the world. The options are very clear. And Israel has always claimed that this demographic imbalance will basically annihilate the messianic concept of the state of Israel, the Jewishness of the state of Israel, which is based totally on discrediting the other and on eliminating the other. And that's why we have a big problem with the Israelis when they are pushing a Jewish state. A Jewish state meaning an exclusive Jewish state, meaning 1.6 million Palestinians who hold Israeli citizenship in Israel are going to be ethnically cleansed into the occupied territories. And that's why the question of right of return is very important. First, those re refugees have the right to come back, and they have the right to opt whether to come back or to have compensation. The 1.6 million Palestinians who hold Israeli citizenship have the right to stay on their land. And that's why we categorically reject the exclusive Jewish state. And from that perspective, I don't believe 
that the right of return should be a threat because I don't believe 10 million Palestinians are going to come back and live in the occupied territories and create that demographic imbalance where the security of Israel will be totally threatened. Israel has been using the right of return in justifying its policies of ethnic cleansing, its policies of total control of the occupied territories, because, as I said, part of our bid for statehood is to tell Mr. Netanyahu in Jerusalem that the West Bank is not a contested territory. The West Bank is Palestinian territory. And that's why creating all these conditions is exacerbating the convulsive violence coming from the Israeli side as an instigative you know, manner to the Palestinians. And uh, I think we have learned our lessons from the past 40 years that peaceful resistance is, is, is the only way for us now as an option to go ahead with our pragmatic policies of gaining more recognition uh, for our independent state to become, uh, I mean, more uh, involved dramatically with the issue of uh, trying to convince uh, many other countries that did not recognize the state of Palestine to recognize us because in the final analysis, Israel has to face the music. And facing the music is the fact that Israel is being totally isolated today in the, in the international community. And we know that Israel doesn't care uh, as long as the US is supporting them. Israel does not care as long as it is above international law. But we care that the international community should wake up. 90 UN resolutions have been in favor of Palestine, and none of them have been implemented. Look at the all resolutions that came against Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and what have you. It, they have been implemented uh, to the last dot for the simple fact that the big police power, the United States, if they are behind a resolution, they either make it succeed or they abort it completely. And unfortunately, on paper, we have been you know, uh, blessed with the support, with the positive reinforcements, but on the ground, we are being still living under occupation. Even if we have 140 uh, states recognizing us, this is not going to change the facts on the ground. Still, eventually, we have either to fight the Israelis or to negotiate with the Israelis. And since we have opted for pragmatism, for negotiations, we need to have a third party that could push the Israeli side to understand that the reality is to make peace with the Palestinians now because, God forbid, 50 years down the pipeline, I cannot see Israel in existence. Well, listen, <clears throat> when we talk about negotiations, these are negotiations, these are talks. You exchange ideas, you throw numbers, I throw numbers. But in the final analysis, you cannot judge any, any side until they sign an agreement with specific numbers that says 10,000, 50,000, 1 million, 2 million. Now, in a, in, in a situation where we sit and, uh, and, and try to throw numbers in negotiations, this is second uh, track negotiations. It's lateral thinking. We think outside the box when we are in second track negotiations. But officially, officially, we have never accepted the fact that you know, family reunification will replace basically the right of return. We never accepted that. Although the Israelis have shoved it in our throat in the Oslo peace process, but we have never accepted it. And, uh, and, and if we want to accept such a thing, it will take 100 years in order to incorporate 1 million Palestinians. I mean, what is the story here? We, we, we categorically rejected it. We don't accept that. But we will sit and try to discuss the concept once the concept is clear between the two parties, then the mechanics and the numbers are academic. First of all, let me tell you, the United States, with all its power and hegemony, has been the biggest disappointment for the Palestinian people, because we always thought that the U.S. as a third party, as an honest broker for peace, could have clinched an agreement long time ago 
between Palestinians and Israelis. However, they have been unequivocally supporting the state of Israel. And as I said, as long as Israel is a domestic issue in the foreign policy making, there will, there will never be a third party that will be an honest broker for peace. Saying that, I think we anticipate the veto power that, is, uh, that uh, the US will, is going to use in the, in the United Nations. Now, we have decided and opted to go to the United Nations after the faltering of the peace process, after we have reached basically an impasse with the Israelis. We needed to move forward. We needed the international community to shoulder our responsibility. We said to them, this is a clear message, for 20 years we have been vacillating in a process that proved to be dismal. It did not work out. We're telling you, international community, please get us the Palestinian state. There are hundreds of resolutions that could support the Palestinians in bidding for their statehood. This is the time where the international community should wake its conscience and look around them. This is the only occupation left in modern history. What a shame to see democracies that claim to be democracies are really supporting fascist regimes like the one today in Israel. This is not acceptable by any standard. So we decided to go to the United Nations for full membership. We were observers. We were recognized by 88 states back, back in 1988 when we have declared our independence. Today, I guarantee you more than 130 countries recognize the state of Palestine. The President Mahmoud Abbas did not go to the United Nations through an incremental approach. He wanted the full membership by going to the Security Council. We knew in order to have our bid on the table for voting, we needed nine countries. So far, we have managed to mobilize eight. We failed with the nine, which is Serbia uh, and Herzegovina, for the simple fact that the United States, they don't want to be embarrassed by using the veto power. They're trying to put pressures on these countries not to accept the bid, even to come on the table for voting. This is the United States flexing muscles using power politics, blackmailing, blackmailing countries in order to pursue its interest of supporting and being the number one protege for Israel. Now, if this doesn't work, and it is not going to work, because eventually if we succeed, the veto power is going to be there, then what would be the position of the United States that is vetoing you know, the self-determination of the Palestinian people and claiming to be, to be the third party that is going to bring the Palestinians and the Israelis to clinch an agreement. I mean, that is going to be very embarrassing. We don't want to embarrass the United States, and we're not waging a war against the United States. We still believe that the only potent country in the world that could really make a difference in this peace process are the Americans. Mm -hmm. But we wanted the international community through the UN to act as a catalyst in helping the Americans in taking more bold moves and less adventuristic as Israel is attempting to do in trying to bring the Palestinians and Israelis together. So we thought by going to the United Nations, if we fail in the Security Council, I think we are going to get the recognition with flying colors in the General Assembly. Albeit, it will be still you know, a full observer status, but it will give us the flexibility to join the specialized agencies of the United Nations. And that's why Israel and the Americans are really worried. They don't want us to be part of the ICC. They don't want us to be part of the ICJ. Because once we become full-fledged members, we don't need a third party for us to claim the war criminals and the heinous crimes that Israel have been committing against our people, especially the war on Gaza. That's why the United States was upset was disturbed, was perturbed by the idea that we went to the United Nations. Because once we get that kind of recognition, then Israel is going to be you know, uh, on its toes. And uh, of course, uh, I believe it's eventually we'll get the, uh, of course, permanent uh, observer status in the United Nations. And uh, of course, a good uh, the litmus test has been our acceptance at UNESCO. And uh, the, 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 the Americans have withdrawn their funds from UNESCO 
like $80 million, which comprises 22% of UNESCO's fund, uh, we said, uh, okay, fine, Qatar immediately paid that money to UNESCO. So the question is not a question of money. And I will say from here to the American administration, our statehood is not for sale. And they cannot keep on blackmailing us through Congress with cutting aids for us. They have, you know, threatened us by cutting $200 million. Congress have taken that decision, unfortunately. But the next day, the Saudis have paid the $200 million. So the issue is not an issue of money. And people cannot keep on, you know, blackmailing us for, for money because our cause is not a charity cause. It does not need an economic solution. It does not need a security solution. It does not need a humanitarian solution. It needs a political solution. We are entitled for self-determination. We earned that title in 1922. We are going to get that self-determination ready. And our state is a matter of time, whether Israel likes it or not. If you go back to the roadmap, you see the first, the first requirement in the roadmap for Palestinians is to build their security systems and to build their economy and their infrastructure. And the first requirement on the Israeli side was to stop settlement activities. The grabbing of land and building settlements does not really reflect the true intentions of Israel in giving back the land. And they haven't done so. As a matter of fact, they expedited the process of building more and more settlements. So we're not breaking the rules, and we're not putting new conditions. Israel is saying that these are new conditions. We asked Israel, put a moratorium on building settlements, and let's put the six final issues on the table, and let's agree. Even the question of settlements, we could find agreements for it. And I don't want to discuss it here because this has been discussed in second track negotiations and even in first track negotiations. You see, settlements only comprise 2% of the West Bank. Our worries is the build up area, which is almost 70%, where Palestinians cannot really build on those 70%. It is called Area C. Now, if you want to talk about keeping the settlements, we can keep the settlements. They can become Palestinian residents with Israeli citizenship. But for those 2%, we would like to have exactly equally in proportion and in quality inside the state of Israel, connecting it with the northern part of Palestine. So for everything, there is a solution. If they are willing to live in the West Bank as Palestinian residents, as there are Palestinians living in Israel as Israeli citizens, Tom P, we say in French, who cares? We are willing to accept that, that kind of an agreement. But to control the settlements, to control the built up area, and to continue building settlements as an impediment for a non-contiguous geographic Palestinian state, this is not acceptable. How are you going to make peace with me when you are creating new facts on the ground every day by building these cancerous settlements? So from that perspective, we have said, no, sir, thank you very much. We're not going to sit and negotiate while you are building settlements. That was President Mahmoud Abbas's position straight outright. Now, Israel basically wants to negotiate for the sake of peace. They want peace without giving up the land. This is the intention of this present day government, maintaining the status quo plus. And how, how could that work? Uh, I mean, <laughs> when we are seeing our land is being every day uh, through creeping annexation being taken from us. And you see, you know, the demolition of houses taking place every day and the situation is getting worse and worse. Why should we negotiate? Why should we negotiate with Israel at a time when we are not even given the opportunity of declaring our self-determination? Why? I mean, so what's the intention of Israel? To talk what? If they don't want to stop settlement activities, if they continue with the Judaization of Jerusalem, if they are seizing Jerusalem IDs, if they are uh, building more settlements and uh, building still the wall all the way to the Jordan Valley, I mean, what are the intentions? These are clear messages that occupation is being perpetual here. And from that perspective, why should we be pushed to sit and talk 
with Netanyahu at a time when all the signals are in the other direction. I, I see the future is very grim. I see, uh, as I said, this conflict is not going to end because you will be having six million Palestinians living there very soon. And if we talk about another five or 10 years, the demographic imbalance will be in favor of the Palestinians. I think Israel has to commit genocide against the Palestinians if they want to get rid of us, or they can commit the Holocaust against the Palestinians. But if they don't, they have to live up with the fact that these people who are living on their land are not going to give up. Whether they would co-opt us and live with us and build high walls on their state, on the armistice line, and accept us you know, as their neighbors, as a democratic neighbor, where democracies don't fight each other, or they will continue living with the siege mentality. They will be on their toes, psychologically will be always obsessed by the issue of security. And I tell you, my dear friend, down the pipeline, Israel cannot continue to live by controlling the Palestinians because the United States is not going to be continuing supporting the state of Israel because as we have seen history changing, we will see history changing also with the downfall of the United States, maybe 50 years, maybe 70 years, we don't know. I don't pretend that the Islamic, 1.5 billion Islamic people with their states are going to sit idle and continue to watch the, the, the desecration of their holy sites. And I cannot see the almost two and a half billion Christians also don't have access to go and visit the holy sites being totally under the control of one monotheistic religion, which is Judaism. I don't see that. I see things are going to change dramatically. It's not going to be in the interest of the United States 20 or 30 years down the pipeline. And that's why Israel has to realize they have to pay the price of pragmatism and they have to pay the price of concessions. And I hate this word concession because they're not conceding anything. This is totally our land. Palestine is totally for us. We have accepted under duress the political realities in accepting the state of Israel. And we have managed to convince our people that we could have our state on 22% of Palestine. But if you go to the heart of every Palestinian, historic Palestine is Palestine for the Palestinians.